I want to talk tonight about one of the noblest acts in American history, something that has sadly been all but forgotten. At its heart, it's a story of charity and compassion, two things that are, it seems to me, always in short supply, and that seems to be especially true these days. On the 13th of July, 1921, Russian writer Maxim Gorky wrote an appeal to the world titled, To All Honest People. Gloomy days have come for the land of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Mendeleev, Pavlov, and Mussorgsky. Russia's misfortunes offer humanitarians a splendid opportunity to demonstrate the vitality of humanitarianism. I ask all honest Europeans and Americans for prompt aid to the Russian people. Give bread and medicine. In 1921, one of the worst famines in history descended on Russia. 30 million people across a vast territory were facing starvation and death nearly a quarter of the entire population. There were several causes for the famine. First was a back-to-back -back series of droughts in 1920 and 1921, the worst droughts Russia had seen in 30 years that had devastated the harvests. Beyond that, however, and perhaps more importantly, were seven years of unending war and revolution. Starting with 1914, with the beginning of World War I, when millions of peasants left the land to go off and fight against the Germans, and then again through to 1917, when Russia experienced two revolutions that brought anarchy to the countryside. When the Bolsheviks seized power in the fall of 1917, a civil war erupted that would last until 1920. The Reds and the Whites both lay waste to the countryside and spread terror behind them. Lenin, shown here, long understood the connection between power and food. In 1891, Russia had experienced a similar famine, one of the worst it had seen. Many at the time in educated society believed, like Leo Tolstoy, that the, everyone needed to do whatever they could to help the suffering. Everyone, that is, except for Lenin. Lenin, the revolutionary, decided that it wasn't charity that would save the peasants from their hard lot, but instead, revolution. He said at the time, the overthrow of the Tsarist monarchy, this bulwark of the landowners, is their only hope for some sort of decent life, for an escape from hunger and unending poverty. Hunger, misery would, Lenin believed, ultimately undermine the Tsarist state and lead to revolution. Now in power, Lenin and the Bolsheviks began to wage a war against the peasants. They forced them at gunpoint to hand over their grain so that the new Soviet state could feed the cities where the workers, their main supporters, lived, as well as the Red Army fighting against the whites. The peasants resisted. They hid their grain. They grew less of it. They even formed a peasant army to fight back against the Reds. This meant that when the drought hit, there was literally no extra grain. There was no cushion. By March of 1921, Lenin was terrified that with no food available, the Soviet state that he had spent his life dedicated to creating might collapse, having lost the support of the workers and the Red Army soldiers. He said that spring, if there is a harvest, then everybody will hunger a little and the government will be saved. Otherwise, since we cannot take anything from people who do not have the means of satisfying their own hunger, the government will perish. Herbert Hoover was born in 1874 in West Branch, Iowa. He came from a family of Quakers. His parents died at the age of nine, and as an orphan, he was sent off to live with an uncle in Oregon. In 1891, he enrolled with the first class at Stanford University, graduating four years later with a degree in geology. His grades were mediocre. He even impressed few of his students a uh, few of his professors, and no one held out any great expectations for him. He set off for the Australian outback where he worked in the gold mines and then made his way on to China. He quickly rose up the ranks in the world of international mining. He had a rare talent as an administrator, and he found new ways to turn mines around that had been failing to make money where others hadn't. And by 1914, he was living in London with his family, a rich and successful man, the head of his own international mining operation. But he was bored. 
He, the, fun, the fun had gone out of, of making money. When World War I erupted and the Germans invaded Belgium, famine uh, and hunger threatened the country. And Hoover took a totally new direction with his life and threw himself headlong into international relief and charity. He put together a relief effort that went over and saved the Belgians from starvation. And he became known and hailed as the savior of Belgium. In 1917, he went back to the United States and President Woodrow Wilson appointed him head of the US Food Administration. In 1919, Woodrow Wilson pushed, uh, was pushed by Hoover to create an organization called the American Relief Operation or Administration with the loan of $100 million from Congress that would be used to feed and rebuild war-torn Europe. In 1921, Hoover was appointed Secretary of Commerce in the Warren Harding administration. And it was that summer in July 1921 that Hoover read Gorky's appeal to the world in an American newspaper. He sprang into action and he knew exactly what had to be done. And he sent a telegram to Gorky the very next day saying the Americans were coming to help. Hoover took the tens of millions in the funds of the American Relief Administration, the ARA, and then sought an additional $20 million from Congress. Now, there were very many people in the United States who were against this appeal for more money from Hoover. On the political left, there were those who were convinced that Hoover's real goal was not aid to the Russians, but a desire to overthrow the first socialist state. They insisted that official political recognition of the Soviet regime and not charity is what was needed at the time. But most of the criticism came from the right. And there was a series of arguments that were made against Hoover's efforts to help Russia. Some insisted that there was no real crisis and that in fact, all this money that was going to be spent buying American grain was nothing but a gift to American farmers. Others were certain that we had enough poor and hungry people in our own country that we didn't need to go halfway around the world to help somebody else. Some insisted that it was their own fault anyway, that the Russians had brought this tragedy on themselves and we needn't concern themselves ourselves with it, and that in fact this might be the best way to defeat Bolshevism, was to let the country starve and the government collapse. And then there were some even like Henry Ford, who insisted that the ARA led by Hoover was in fact a corrupt organization infiltrated by what he called Jews and Bolsheviks. But Hoover insisted and was not to be deterred. He said at the time, the sole object of relief should be humanity. It should have no other political objective or aim other than the maintenance of life and order. He agreed that in his idea, Soviet Russia was a murderous tyranny, but he also insisted that the United States had a humane obligation to aid the suffering. He also added that the United States could still easily afford it, noting that the American people spend billions of dollars a year on tobacco and cosmetics. Certainly 20 million for Russians starving shouldn't be too hard. And in the end, the United States would come up with nearly $60 million of relief that would go to feed and help starving Russia. This particular photograph here shows one of the ARA warehouses in New York City full of sacks of grain that are about to be shipped off to Russia. Now, it wasn't just some Americans who were skeptical of Hoover and the operation. The Soviets were profoundly worried about what Hoover was up to. They knew his anti-communist reputation, and they, in fact, had made a revolution to try to overthrow capitalism. The idea of letting capitalists back into the country to help them was obviously repugnant and terrifying. They believed that, in fact, Hoover would try to foment counter-revolution and bring their government down. Lenin gave strict orders that once the Americans came, they had to be placed under intense surveillance. Agents of the secret police, the Chika, uh, which later became the KGB, would be used to infiltrate the ARA's operations once it came into Russia. But at the end of the day, Lenin knew that they needed this help, that ultimately they had to swallow this bitter pill and allow the Americans to come. The first ARA men arrived in Moscow on the 27th of August, 1921. On the 1st of September, the first food arrived in Petrograd. And five days later, the first ARA kitchen was opened in Petrograd on Moika Street. Four days later, the first kitchen opened in Moscow 
in what was once a fashionable Tsarist restaurant called The Hermitage. This is one of the more unusual ARA kitchens. This is the Alexander Palace at Tsarskaya Silo outside St. Petersburg, which was the home of the Tsars. And in fact, it was at the Alexander Palace that the last Tsar, Nicholas II, and his wife, Alexandra, and their family were living after the revolution when they were taken off into exile into the Urals in Siberia and then later uh, brutally murdered. This particular kitchen served over 2,000 children a day, and apparently one of the chefs who worked in it was the former cook of the last czar. Now, the original plan was to feed a million children, but very quickly the Americans realized that this was not going to be enough, that the demand was much, much greater, and by December they realized that at least seven million ch children were starving. An American by the name of Frank Golder made one of the first trips out into the famine region, and he wrote after this, the famine is bad beyond all imagination. It is the most heartbreaking situation that I have ever seen. Millions of people are doomed to die, and they are looking it calmly in the face. To see Russia makes one wish that he were dead. It was sites like this that Golder encountered that made him wish he were dead. This is a group of young children, refugees, in a camp in Samara province. These are the sorts of scenes that he encountered. He recalled one incident that was especially troubling and horrifying on his journey. It was the sight of an old woman down on all fours in the dirt, fighting with some pigs over a small scrap of pumpkin rind. He heard tales of mothers killing their children and then killing themselves so they wouldn't have to watch them starve. The orphanages and children's homes and hospitals were the most horrific places. There were homes set up for orphan children intended to hold no more than 30 that were now full of 400 or 500. The conditions were beyond description. Often the children just lay in rags on the floors. One ARA man said after visiting one of these orphanages, there's just enough food and heat to make their death a slow one. After a few months, another ARA man wrote to his fiance back home. I often think of how people in New York told me how they envied me the opportunity of seeing so many interesting things. Yes, it's very interesting to move among people who at a glance tells you would be better off dead than alive. There's no escape, even in this railway car, for men and women come to the door begging for bread, and children can be heard whining beneath the car window whenever the light is showing. The ARA men quickly developed something that became known as famine shock, sort of a new version of shell shock from World War I. The hungry peasants first ate whatever grain they had. After this, they would kill and eat their livestock. Once they had gone through the livestock, they would hunt down every last cat and dog in the village. Then they would often collect bones and grind them into a paste. After that, they tried to survive on grass, weeds, tree bark, and the thatch off their roofs. Some eventually succumbed to cannibalism. Some of them murdered their victims in their homes and ate them. Others would go out and raid cemeteries at night and dig up the freshly dead to bring home to cut up and eat became so bad that the local officials had to lock up all the dead bodies in stables and sheds to keep people from eating them. A young man by the name of Peterim Sarokin, a young academic who went out to make an inspection of the famine zone at the time, who then later would go on to become a world famous sociologist at Harvard, wrote in a memoir, the Russian revolution promised to save the people from despotism. The Bolsheviki promised to give food to everyone. If they, not, if they did not keep those vows, at least they gave the people the communion of human sacrifice, of human flesh and blood. Now, there's a good deal of photographic evidence of, of cannibalism that are kept in the ARA archives, which are at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Um, and for the research on this book, I, I went through dozens and dozens of these photographs that are simply horrifying and gut-wrenching and, and difficult to, to look at. Um, I purposely chose not to include those in my talk uh, because it is, it is difficult for a lot of people. Instead, what I'm showing you is a series of, of small 
gouache paintings that were done by a man living in the Russian famine zones at the time who did a series of 10 or 12 of these depictions of what life was like. And this is one of them from 1922. It says, uh, the Russian village for February and March. And then the word on the far right is ludoyetstva, which means cannibalism in Russia. And here is, is a woman literally being murdered so that this family can eat her. And these sorts of things sadly did take place. From the very beginning, the Americans realized that the mission was going to have to grow way beyond their original expectations. Um, this famine of the early 20s is sometimes referred to as the Volga River region famine or the Pavolzhia famine, but in fact, this is completely misleading. It was much bigger, much more extensive uh, than the Volga region. In fact, it eventually stretched to one million square miles of territory. So here's uh, Moscow up here. Volga flows down through here. Here's the Caspian, the Black Sea. But the famine stretched all the way throughout Ukraine, which then had a population of 26 million, 9 million of whom were starving. And then it extended well off to the east into the Ural Mountains and also included parts of northern Russia and even down into the Caucasus in Dagestan where the Americans ended up working. There was never more than 200 Americans in Russia at the time working the famine. So to actually make this operation go, they had to hire local Russians and eventually they put together a, a group of 125,000 Russians to do much of the actual work in fighting the famine. Um, the challenges were obviously enormous. Just one of them was transportation. Of course, we're talking about a, a, a vast territory, a million square miles, um, and the railroads in the country were basically destroyed after the years of the Civil War. The rail cars had been shot up, the wood had been all torn off them for fuel and fire, firewood and things like that. The railroads, the locomotives were rusted out. So these were in a horrible condition. The railroads that were working, the, the, the engines and cars they could get and could get to run were often attacked by bandits and thieves along the way. And the railroads didn't go out into the deep provinces but only to the major towns and cities. And so one had to then get the food from there out into, into the distant villages. Now, Russia has never been known for its uh, wonderful paved roads, uh, dirt roads mostly, and then in the spring months they turn to seas of mud at which you cannot even move. So the best time to get the food out actually happened to be in the winter when they could use sleighs that would fly across uh, the ice and snow, although sometimes they didn't have horses and so in fact they were forced to rely on camels. And this is a, a camel uh, convoy from Tsaritsyn, which is now Volgograd, used to be Stalingrad, taking uh, American food out into the uh, countryside. The Americans, being Americans, of course, came over with cars. They had uh, a bunch of Cadillac touring cars. They had some Fords and some Liberty trucks uh, left over from World War I. And these would work in the major cities, but were obviously no good uh, out in places like this. Um, Life was pretty grim in most Russian cities, as you can probably imagine, at this time, especially outside Moscow and Petersburg. Living conditions were rustic, uh, to say the least, and many of these towns were quite dangerous, especially after dark. All of the men who worked for the ARA very quickly acquired guns, typically a Colt or some other pistol or revolver. Um, when they would walk home at night, from their offices back to the personnel houses, they would typically walk down the middle of the streets so that they had more of a jump on anybody who might be coming out to try to steal them, rob them, whatever, knock them over the head. Um, there were repeated attempts uh, at burglary of the American personnel houses. On several occasions, the Americans were woken up in the middle of the night with men storming in with guns and the Americans having to literally get up out of their beds and fire back and try to chase them off. Uh, one group woke up one night uh, and someone outside had tried to burn their house down while they were sleeping. Uh, so there was never uh, a lot of boredom. On top of this, they were always being monitored by the Cheka, by the secret police, who watched their every move, read their mail, uh, and then also forced a lot of the Russian employees to spy on the Americans, threatening to lock them up if they didn't cooperate. 
But the biggest threat of all was disease, and especially typhus, the, uh, which you get from an infected uh, flea or, or, or a louse. And this was the greatest fear that all Americans had, because it was so widespread, it was so hard to, to avoid. It was in all the furniture, it was in all the clothing. When the Americans would go to these orphanages, uh, orphanages and children's homes and see these desperate, dying little children, they were torn because they'd never dared touch them or pick them up because they knew that they stood a good chance of coming down with typhus, which would often be fatal. The Russian couriers who had to bring supplies back and forth along the railroad system, railroads which were very crowded, always seemed to pick up uh, typhus, and at one point, half of all of them were in the hospital. That's a picture of Kazan, by the way. This is one of the main streets to give you an idea of, of sort of what the conditions were like. There was a good deal of mission creep that happened once the Americans got over and got started. They very real, soon realized that food was not gonna be enough to address this crisis. Um, as I mentioned, typhus was a problem, and it wasn't just typhus. There were all sorts of uh, infectious diseases, cholera, smallpox, malaria, Hospitals lacked the most basic supplies. Aspirin was non-existent, nor were bandages. Typically, if someone needed bandages, needed to be treated for bleeding, they would find old newspapers and wrap them around their festering wounds. The ARA ended up importing millions of dollars uh, of vaccines and drugs and disinfectants and even blankets for hospitals. They set up free dental clinics they outfitted a large hospital train that would travel from town to town treating people. They installed water purification systems in several cities to reduce cholera outbreaks. Here's just one American uh, health clinic in Petrograd where children are being inoculated against uh, cholera and, and typhoid. Uh, they also brought over over half a million pounds of clothing and shoes. You saw earlier the rags that the kids had been reduced to wearing. Here are three young kids in the city of Odessa. Uh, they've got their new stiff leather American shoes that look so, uh, I don't know. I think you'd probably break your ankle trying to walk in them. They look so uncomfortable. But anyway, better than what they had. And then their clothes are in fact uh, made out of those grain sacks that we saw in the earlier photo that were then cut and sewn into clothes for the little children. They also provided a good deal of aid and relief to teachers and scholars and artists. They put up uh, a special feeding program for intellectuals and academics. Um, it's hard to imagine, but uh, the uh, scientific community in Russia, due to the revolution and the war, had been cut off from years of advances with what was going on in Europe and the United States. And so the ARA helped to bring over 28,000 pounds just of scientific literature, and they began sending subscriptions to various medical journals to the universities there. Among those who received help was none other than Nobel Prize laureate uh, Ivan Pavlov, shown here, obviously, with one of his famous dogs. <laughs> Photograph taken by the ARA. Um, now, it wasn't just all work. These were young men, obviously, who went over to work the operation, and they had to have, uh, they had to have a let out. They had to have some fun. Um, they loved going to the theater. Those who lived in Moscow and Petrograd would go to the ballet, they would go to the opera. In the summer, they would picnic at the old noble estates outside the cities or go boating or swimming or what have you. They even made sure to bring over uh, baseballs, bats, and gloves and had several impromptu baseball games. This one uh, is taking place in the town of Simbirsk. Uh, you see the pitcher and the catcher and the batter. Uh, and then there's a Russian over here wondering what is going on. This is probably some of the first baseball ever in, in Russia. They organized a series of games on the 4th of July in 1922 as part of their Independence Day celebrations. There was a good deal of partying as well. They brought with them their Victrolas, their records. They would foxtrot with the young Russian women who, they worked, uh, who worked alongside them. Uh, the most famous party they threw was a, sort of a bacchanalia for Thanksgiving in 1921 in Moscow, 
at which the guest of honor was none other than Isadora Duncan, who apparently danced uh, much of the night for everybody. And perhaps not surprising, there was a good deal of drinking, uh, not only amongst themselves, but the Soviet officials, the counterparts that they worked alongside, loved to see if they could drink the Americans under the table. Um, the preferred drink was something the Russians call samagon, which some of you out there may have experience with, which is basically a moonshine. Uh, one ARA man had some of this and wrote later, it looked like water and smelled like a mix of gin, three-in-one oil, and kerosene. <laughs> After drinking a cup of that, he did not dare light his pipe. And there was a good deal of romance as well. So when the Americans went over, almost none of them knew a word of Russian. And they realized, obviously, they were going to have to hire interpreters and translators to help them out. Many of them were young women, many of them from the former educated classes of the Tsarist era, and quite a few of them, in fact, from the old Russian nobility, the people known as former people. Um, we don't know how many affairs went on, but uh, there were about 30 marriages between the young Americans and their uh, uh, Russian girlfriends uh, who became known as famine brides. This is one of them here, a woman by the name of Georgina Dobrilkin Klakachova. She was another one of these former people from a once wealthy Russian noble family that had lived in Petersburg for several centuries. The family lost everything in the revolution, and Georgina had been reduced to selling matches in the streets to try and raise a bit of money for her and her mother. She was one of them who was hired on as an interpreter translator at the ARA since she spoke perfect English. And it was in the ARA office in Petrograd that Georgina caught the eye of a man by the name of Jay Reeves Childs. Here's Childs in one of the ARA kitchens in Kazan. For Childs, it was love at first sight. He was from Lynchburg, Virginia, went on to study at Harvard, and then had fought in France in World War I. Like many of the young American men, he signed up to work for the ARA because it sounded like a great adventure. He also had dreams of becoming a writer. That was his great desire in life. And he thought nothing would give him greater material for a novel than his stint in Russia. But he was also motivated by a sense of service, by a, an obligation to help the less fortunate. He had a certain sympathy for the Bolshevik Revolution even, and was a very proud socialist. He voted for Eugene Debs in the election of 1920. He's uh, a character in my book that I sort of dubbed the idealist. Um, when I was trying to figure out how I would approach this subject, how to tell the story of the famine and American relief in a way that was engaging, I decided that to, to bring it down to the more human level, it made sense to pick a few of these Americans and focus the story on them. Now, it turns out they are all men that I focus on because the ARA only hired men to go over, convinced that women would be in too great a danger. Thus, only men were hired, and uh, only basically Protestant men were hired, the thinking being at the time that Jews, if they were to go over, would face too much anti-Semitism and potential violence. So I ended up digging deep into the archives in, at the Hoover, at various places around the country, and I came away with four men who, for various reasons, seemed to embody uh, the spirit of the operation and approached the tragedy and their work there from somewhat different perspectives. I have the idealist child. And then I selected another character, Frank Golder, who I mentioned earlier, who was originally born in Russia, immigrated to the US as a boy, uh, got his PhD in Russian history at Harvard, spent a little while teaching at Wazoo, uh, and then got a job as the first Russian historian at Stanford University. And he was one of the only people that worked for the ARA who knew the language, knew the history, and knew the country. And he approached it with a much more realistic eye. So he's my realist. Then I found a fascinating, wonderful guy by the name of William Kelly, another uh, Harvard graduate. For some reason, these guys all seem to go to Harvard. Um, I don't know. Um, also fought in World War I, later went on to become a New York ad exec, but he, he was the most sardonic and the most cynical, and he would write all of these letters back home 
uh, with all sorts of, um, in many ways insightful, in some ways distasteful, in some ways, uh, um, I don't know, unhelpful comments, but he became the cynic for me, the one who looked at Russia and said, this place is doomed, I need to get the hell out of here. My fourth is, uh, again, another Harvard man who studied economics there, a guy by the name of Harold Fleming, who I dub my romantic. He went over, again, seeking adventure and excitement, um, and he wasn't finding it the first few months he was there until he got a new uh, Russian language instructor and fell in love with her uh, and all of a sudden he decided Russia was the greatest place in the world and went on to have a series of, of love affairs uh, bouncing back and forth um, but he too wrote home all these wonderful letters that sort of helped me sort of bring the story to life. But back to Childs standing here in between an interpreter and a Soviet official with one of those uh, World War I surplus trucks that they had brought over. Childs arrived in Russia in September of 21 and immediately was sent to the city of Kazan in the Tatar Republic. He set to work as soon as he got there. It was an enormous job because it was an enormous territory. Four and a half million uh, people covering 96,000 square miles that they had to feed. And he worked like a dog, as did most of these people. And in fact, most, uh, not only of the Americans who were there working, but most of the Russians as well gave their lives, worked tirelessly to fight the famine. But there were exceptions. There was a wonderful little anecdote I found in Harold Fleming's writings about how he had hired a draftsman to work in the office. And when the draftsman found out that they had to start work at nine every morning, he replied, ah, yes, this is how you capitalists exploit us. <laughs> he did not last long in that job. Childs nearly gave his life for the job. He contracted typhus and was close to death and had to be sent to Berlin to recover. But still, he wanted to go back and keep working. He wrote to his mother while in Germany, I'm so anxious to get back to Kazan. The Russian experience is the richest I have ever had. I wouldn't take anything for it. Much of this, of course, was thanks to Georgina. He had her moved from Petrograd to Kazan they moved into each other's shared place there. And then later that summer, they went back to Petrograd to get the blessing of Georgina's mother so they could marry and were married in the resplendent St. Isaac's Cathedral in Petrograd. In two years, the ARA had carried out the greatest humanitarian relief operation in history. At the peak, they were feeding 11 million people a day in 28,000 cities, towns, and villages. They had shipped from the US a million tons of food, seed, clothing, and medicine, and distributed medical supplies to 15,000 hospitals. They had inoculated 10 million people against disease and clearly had saved well over 10 million lives. Yet despite all of these efforts, it's estimated that somewhere around 6, mi six million people perished in the famine, making it one of the worst in world history. But it wasn't just food and medicine and clothing that the Americans gave to the Russians. They also gave them hope. The Hoover Archive uh, has in its collection dozens of thank you cards and thank you letters written by the Russians to the Americans before they went back home. And some of them are beautifully illustrated like this one here that I wanted to show you. This is from a group of women in the city of Sevastopol in the Crimea to the Americans, dated March 14th, 1923. Um, up at the top, it's kind of hard to make out, but that is the New York City skyline. You can just see the Statue of Liberty a bit to the left, and then the American ships bringing grain, but then the grain is here depicted as life preservers going down into a bloody Red Sea, each one with the letters ARA written on it. And the text reads, we, the women and mothers of Sevastopol's Southern District, overflowing with fervent gratitude, extend to you our sincere thanks for the help and concern you have extended to our children at this trying time. Tears of emotion pour from our eyes at the sight of how our children's faces that were pale and exhausted are once again fresh and healthy, thanks to the fraternal help of the Americans. Our children are happy, 
We mothers are joyous, and we now have hope for the future. May the hearts who made this possible be forever blessed, and may the hand that gives always be full. Here's some of those children now full of hope. This is from uh, one of the soup kitchens in Moscow, four little girls having lunch. On the 23rd of July, 1923, the ARA closed its operations in Moscow and left the country. Maxim Gorky, the writer I began the talk with, wrote again to Herbert Hoover. In all the history of human suffering, I know of nothing more trying to the souls of men than the events through which the Russian people are passing. And in the history of humanitarianism, I know of no accomplish which in terms of magnitude and generosity can be compared to the relief that you have accomplished. The generosity of the American people resuscitates the dream of fraternity among people at a time when humanity greatly needs charity and compassion. Your help will be inscribed in history as a unique and gigantic accomplishment worthy of the greatest glory and will long remain in the memory of millions of Russian children whom you have saved from death. Gorky had been right. In 1975, so over 50 years later, J. Reeves Childs, now an old man in his mid-80s, returned to the Soviet Union. He had spent the intervening years in service in the United States State Department around the world, including one stint as ambassador to Saudi Arabia and then to Ethiopia. He went back to the Soviet Union alone, Georgina having died in 1964. And upon his arrival there, he told an airport official that he had worked with the relief team of Americans back in the 1920s. With that, this Russian man's eyes widened, his face lit up, and he whispered with reverence, A-R-A. -A. <laughs> Many Russians at the time still remembered and were still grateful for America's unbelievable charity and compassion. Thank you. Yes, I would like to ask, um, in, as a historian, what does this teach you about America's overall regard for humanitarian aid uh, towards other countries in the world? And how did you get started in all of this? Yeah, um, I don't know. I felt like this was a story that, uh, when I first learned about it, I, I found out about this story when I did an earlier book called Former People, which is about what happened to the nobility after the revolution. And I learned about these uh, young uh, Russian women who worked for the Americans when they showed up uh, in the early 20s. And I, I found it really fascinating that I'd never heard of it, even though I'd spent all these years studying Russian history. Um, and so I knew someday I'd want to return to it. I'm not sure exactly all that it says about you know, the breadth of America's history with charity and with humanitarian work. For me, it stands as like this sort of exemplary moment where I really feel the United States did the right thing and should be uh, proud of what it did and should in fact just know about what it did. That uh, this was a time when we overcame political differences both uh, within the U.S. over the idea of this operation, and then with the Soviet government, and we found a way to get through all of the politics and actually save people's lives. And I just felt, when I uh, got interested in the story, that this was something that people needed to know about, because people just don't. Um, like, how I got into this, I started studying Russian language in college, and I fell in love with the language and the literature, and started going to Russia and working there, studying there. Um, and I got what's called the Russian bug, um, uh, not typhus. Um, uh, and I've never been cured. And so I just, I don't know, I keep writing these books about Russia just because I find it such an endlessly fascinating place. Hi. <laughs> um, so we just had the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. We yeah. all know about the Berlin airlift. This is a bigger than that. How come we don't know about this? Yeah, that's a good question. Why don't we know about it? I, th I, I mean, I think part of it has to do with the fact that Hoover's reputation was destroyed because, um, following the Depression for the most part. Uh, 
Um, he became, you know, in shorthand, you know, the, the man who, you know, caused the depression or couldn't get us out of the depression or what have you. And so the things that he had done in Belgium, the things that he had done throughout Europe after World War I, uh, and then this amazing job in, in Russia was, was forgotten, partially because of that. And then I think partially due to the Cold War, we didn't want to be reminded for a long time that in fact we had found a way to you know, work together to cooperate with Soviet Russia. And so for, I think for those reasons it kind of fell out of, uh, fell out of our consciousness and was, and was forgotten. I mean there's always been, a, you know, you could always find maybe a couple of Russian historians in this country that had heard about it, um, but it just it wasn't even widely known, I'd say, among, among specialists. Uh, okay, yeah. Hi, I, I read the Former People book and I, I thought it was brilliant and I really recommend it if people haven't read it. Um, I was curious that after this stepping in and helping with the famine that this didn't mitigate the Cold War at all or did it? Yeah, that's a good question. Is like, you know, sort of was there political fallout or did it lead to political um, changes? I, you know, in a short talk, there's so much that's in the book that I'm not able to address. And one of the things that I talk about in there that's interesting is, you know, Hoover sent these men over and said, we are not going to get involved in politics. We're going to go deliver aid and relief, and then we're going to come back home. But the American men who go over there and are living there start to, to wonder, well, what is the right answer going forward, and should we be doing more? And so there are these various voices competing within the ranks of the ARA among those who say, um, we should uh, offer political recognition of the Soviet government, uh, and that we can then have more influence on their internal development. Um, there are others that even insisted that having seen how we Americans do things, they will ditch communism and want to you know, be more like us Americans. Um, so there was a good deal of divergence of opinion about what, what should happen. Um, Hoover and the Harding administration did not want to recognize the Soviet government, and that, in fact, would not come until FDR in 33. Um, so they did not want to go down that road for a, a number of reasons. And the Soviet government itself, as soon as the Americans left the country, uh, this is something else I talk about in the book but not in the talk, uh, they did everything they could to wipe out any trace that America had ever been there. Any trace whatsoever. And what they could not wipe out, they twisted into a new story uh, namely that the ARA men had not really been there to deliver aid, but to foment counter-revolution. But the Cheka had been all over them, and they had to go back home unsuccessful. Yeah. Uh, in uh, the uh, Dust Bowl, now that was partly uh, the, the, the crash, the, the financial crash, but the other part of it was that the U.S. government had encouraged and gotten the banks to lend money for mechanized farming to you know tear up Kansas and Ohio, uh, Colorado and all and farm it massively for wheat which because they use they weren't they didn't know what techniques to use that half of you know a lot of the topsoil blew away so uh, what was the there must have been a connection I never knew the story that you're telling there must but my my ancestors were on, in that dust bowl so there must have been a connection between the ARA and Hoover's wanting to promote the vast wheat farming that, yeah, of 1930. Yeah, it's a good question. I haven't thought about that. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the cause of the famine um, in Russia was very different than our situation with the Dust Bowl because, you know, Russia in those days, they didn't have mechanized farming. I mean, their farming methods in 1920 were basically the same they had been in 1720 and 1520. Um, uh, and so, and then obviously the famine it comes 10 years before, and I'm not an expert in the, the U.S. Dust Bowl, um, and, you know, what Hoover might have done as president, uh, I'm literally just not a specialist to answer that, if I understood your question. Yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I'd be curious, I'd be, you know, maybe look, look at that in the yeah. future, because it's the same man, and it involves wheat in both places, and they were both huge programs. Uh, by the government, or in, in, when he, as Hoover, he was part of the ARA originally, yeah. but then it was the government, so there must, 
There must have been a connection through Hoover there. Yeah, well, I do. I mean, Hoover did uh, do relief back in the United States after the Russia famine. There was the horrible uh, flood of the Mississippi, and I think it was, I think the year was twenty seven, um, producing you know thousands and thousands of refugees. And Hoover was put in charge of um, sort of responding to this epic crisis. And uh, he became known then as the master of emergencies. That was the name of his presidential movie, apparently the first presidential campaign movie ever in 1928. Um, there's an uh, understory to what he did in that crisis, which is really awful that I touch on in my book, is that basically most all the aid in the you know, areas along the Mississippi went to help white farmers. And black farmers basically not only got nothing, but were often held in camps at gunpoint and forced to do all the rebuilding work without being paid for it. Um, and then Hoover did something even later during the, the uh, Depression, which not many people know about, but basically uh, green-lighted the uh, expulsion of, of something like 750,000 um, people of Mexican descent, many of them American citizens, out of the United States back to Mexico, insisting that if we throw these people out, then there'll be more jobs for real Americans. So Hoover's a complicated man. On one hand, one of the greatest humanitarians. On another hand, he did some really reprehensible things as well. Uh, okay, yeah. Doug, prior to this book, you'd already done just an immense amount of research and work already in, in Russian history and civilization. Were there any really significant new insights in the process of doing this book that you gained on uh, Russian civilization or culture that just kind of, you know, any major new things that you learned that really, really knocked you out? I think one of the things that, that always surprises me um, um, when I delve into a research project like this and, is I learned the extent to which Russia suffered in the 20th century. Um, and some people would say self-inflicted or not, whatever, it doesn't matter. The degree to which they have suffered um, from the, you know, it starts in 1905, the revolution, Russo-Japanese war, you get World War I, you get two revolutions, you get a civil war, you get collectivization under Stalin, you get Stalin's terror, you get World War II. I mean, it just amazes me their will and power to survive what they have been through and how little, I think, in this country, we appreciate the degree to which people suffered in Russia in the 20th century and still managed to you know, hold the country together and, and produce great uh, you know, thinkers and artists and writers and things. I, that's one of the things that I sort of came away from with this. I think another thing I came away from with, from this particular book is um, no outside country can determine Russia's internal course of development. And there were a lot of people arguing that, oh, if we would recognize Soviet Russia, we could sort of bend them more towards us. And I came away convinced that, in fact, no, the more anyone would try to bend them in any one direction or another would force them to recoil and try to go the opposite way. Uh so uh, this is obviously a great, uh, really compelling story, but there are parts of it that are not easy to read. I mean, terrible things happened to people. People did terrible things. And uh, you have, you know, you were obviously working on unfiltered primary research and had orders of attitude more time to wade into that research. Was it tough at times? And how did you kind of manage that process of being, you know, not being depressed or, or, or being depressed and managing that? Yeah, no, it's... Uh... I think the hardest was um, I, I did a good deal of work at, uh, as I mentioned, at the Hoover Institution Archive down at Stanford. And they have an enormous photo collection that uh, ARA men uh, took during the operation. And also the Cheka took photographs of people arrested of cannibalism because it was a crime. And they would take pictures of the people arrested with evidence of the crime. Um, and, and then there was a great many number of photographs of people in the late stages of starvation, um, images of, of, of um, mass graves. Um, and to be sitting there in California looking at these photographs was profoundly disturbing. And something that I really struggled with 
was trying to find what is the right balance in my book. Because I, I, I wanted to make sure I gave everyone a real sense of just how horrific it was, but I didn't want to be accused of sensationalism or promoting famine porn or whatever you might want to call it, and trying to find a way that respected the story but didn't, didn't in any way kind of cheapen it, if you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so I was very careful in the images that I selected to uh, strike a balance, because there were a lot of photographs I saw that I said, I literally can't put this in this book. It's too, it felt like a violation of that person in that, in that particular image. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, actually I suffered more, I'd say, uh, my, wife, my wife Stephanie can attest to this, um, uh, when I worked on the book Former People about what happened to the Russian uh, nobility after the revolution, and God, these stories were horrible, just horrible. And they went on decade after decade after decade of repression and repression. And I got to know the descendants of these families and was invited to their homes and everything. And then I'd, I'd, I'd come home from these research trips to Russia just like reeling, you know, and then we'd have a dinner party somewhere and somebody was complaining that Johnny didn't get on the varsity soccer team or something. And I'd be like, you know, until your grandfather's locked up for 20 years or you're eating your pets, you know, I don't want to hear about it. And I'd, I kind of lose it sometimes and we'd have to leave the party early. But <laughs> this book I handle a little bit better, I think. Yeah. I, um, I have a question that's about your sources, because you said you know, you've did a lot of work at the Hoover Institute yeah. with the archives there. And also you've pointed out that the, for political reasons, the Soviet government didn't want, didn't give a lot of attention to this, um, this action afterwards, they kind of didn't want people to know about what happened. So in the research that has been done on um, the ARA's work, either that you've done or that other scholars have done, um, how much is there information from Russia that informs the narrative? Yeah, that's or has a, that just been kind of erased away? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, there's a good deal of published um, historical works about the famine in Russia but they typically ignore the ARA, or if they mention it, it's, it's in passing, or it's again, it's this idea that actually it was a counter revolution there was a Trojan horse, they'd call it Herbert Hoover's Trojan horse, right? Uh, that's how they would refer to, refer to it. Um, I did uh, get information out of one of the main archives in Moscow, the State Archive of the Russian Federation, had a bunch of stuff, but it was mostly um, official uh, Soviet government stuff, uh, you know, about the agreements with the Americans and the numbers of food coming in and, and that kind of thing. Um, I did manage to get out some of the internal correspondence among Soviet officials about the ARA at the time, which was really enlightening, and I include that in the book, where especially when the Americans are getting ready to leave and the Russians know they're getting ready to leave, and the Russians then are trying to figure out, okay, how do we get our hands on as much of their stuff as possible? Like those Cadillacs, I mean, they're not letting those Cadillacs go back. They got the Cadillacs, the Fords, the trucks. Um, they tried to really sort of um, take hold of everything that the Americans had with them. And then the process by which they began to uh, mythologize for their own purposes what this whole thing had been about in Moscow and in the archive in Saratov, Russia. There's stuff on that that I got, yeah. Oh, yeah. One follow-up question. Um, was anyone kind of within the lifetimes of the people who were affected by the famine, was anyone able to do like an oral history of say the people who had been children in the famine who are in these photos or like the guy at the airport who remembered ARA or have, has their story just been those, lost. it's sad, those stories were all lost. Um, occasionally you can find in some of the Russian language books on the famine, occasional sentence or two. But I mean, life was, life was so hard and they wanted to put this behind them. Um, and then you gotta remember that 10 years later they get hit with another massive famine during collectivization in the early 1930s. Um, and so it's, it, there literally wasn't uh, much effort placed uh, on, on doing that kind of work, so, okay. <laughs>
So, um, wow, thank you, because um, speaking of oral history, now it makes sense, because my family had um, lived through famine, and the story I got from my grandmother is, no one helped us, so we had to go, and they ended up in Central Asia. So in terms of oral history, it is unbelievable, because I had no idea, because we never heard of anyone helping us. Not us, but my grandparents. So there goes the, so this is kind of revelatory. Um, so the question I have is actually about the Americans who came. Did any of them stay? Or did it, you, you know, I do know that later a lot of um, young communists came to, the, to, to Russia and stayed. Did, the, was this, uh, did this um, mission serve as an impetus for the, Russian, uh, for the Americans to move to, the, to, the, to Russia, uh, to the Soviet Union, rather? Right, that's a good question. I don't, I don't have information that any of the Americans with the ARA stayed. Some of them would go back. Uh, like Golder went back several times. He wanted to put together like a joint uh, research study program on, on the history of the revolution with some Soviet Russian scholars. And he tried to make contacts and connections. Um, but by the late 20s with the rise of Stalin and the total chilling of relations, um, all of those things were, were ditched and died. Um, and I only really know about Americans going to live in the Soviet Union more in what you were referring to, especially once you get the depression, people out of work, industrialization is happening in the Soviet Union under Stalin, people do start to go over for, for jobs and engineers go over and that sort of thing. But I, as far as I know, every one of these men went back home, yeah. All righty, okay, one last question and then we should probably uh, move on, sure. So one little story you mentioned offhandedly was about how um, one of the ARA households in Russia uh, was like firebombed. And I was wondering if you could elucidate more on why, because certainly like the robbery makes more sense because you can take what they have and you know, get the food or whatever. But firebombing is like much more destructive than that and is probably more malicious. And maybe as an extension, could you maybe elaborate on um, the, the politics of how the ARA interacted with the peasantry, both the peasantry that would uh, support the Bolsheviks and those who did not support the Bolsheviks? Yeah, that's good questions. I, we don't really have information, or at least I never found information on exactly why that fire was started and who did it. Um, you know, it's, it's possible that there were people uh, in that, I think that might have been in the town of Ufa, uh, there might have been people there who were sort of like, you know, again, we had a revolution to overthrow, you know, the old regime and to create a new socialist society without capitalism and why are, you know, is the government. There were elements like that. Um, they also, the, the ARA men often had real tensions with the Cheka. It's possible that the Cheka was messing with them, um, but we don't really know. In terms of the ARA men's interaction with the peasants, um, most of the ARA men couldn't speak to the peasants because they didn't know Russian. And they did have their interpreters and they would take some notes and things like that. But the one who really uh, engaged the most of all of them was the man I referred to as uh, Frank Golder, who was originally from Russia and then, and then went back with the ARA. And he would go around and tour around and he would speak to people. Uh, and basically everyone that he spoke to, or at least what he records, is they all said, it, you know, it was, it was better under the czars. If only we could have the czars back. That was sort of the uh, view of just about everybody that he spoke to. Um, and I think that was probably, you know, a, f a fairly widespread feeling among, among many, of these, many of these folks. But again, I think a lot of them too, they just, they wanted a life beyond politics. They wanted to just be able to farm their land and, and live their life the way, they, the way they had been. But they had, you know, the countryside had been so brutalized, both by the Reds and the Whites, during those years of the Revolution and Civil War. Uh, could I ask a follow-up, too? Okay. Um, and if this is too much because of time, then feel free to skip it. Okay. But um, I was wondering if you could maybe talk also a little more substantially about the critiques from the left and the right that you mentioned at the beginning, because it sounds like, at least offhandedly on the left side, you mentioned about how many of the ARA thought this was going to, you know, wake people up to say like, oh, capitalism, 
the American way is much preferable to this socialism or communism. And so in that, when you say that, it makes uh, what uh, Lenin's concerns seem much less ridiculous or much more grounded. Um, and also, I think you mentioned for the, the right-wing critique, one was that by aiding the Soviet Union, we'd be uh, you know, perpetuating it, and we wouldn't let it just work itself out and fall apart, which seems to be true just based on the title of the book. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, to, to begin with that point, exactly. I mean, uh, there was a nice review of the book that came out in the uh, Los Angeles Review of Books the other day, um, and the reviewer made that very point, is that, in fact, yes, the United States helped to save the Soviet Union at this time so that then, basically 10 years later, Stalin uh, would help oversee, you know, uh, another horrific famine that would kill even more millions of people. So maybe, you know, they should have let the famine happen and the, and the system collapsed and Stalin wouldn't have happened. But I, I mean, that's a parlor game kind of, I mean, you can't, I mean, if millions of people are dying, you can't think, well, maybe we should let them die because that will, at least I don't, I don't find that a persuasive argument. I mean, as opposed to the people on the left, um, uh, it seemed to me that their critique of, of the Hoover uh, uh, operation was misguided in that they really did believe that, that the way to aid the Soviet Union or Soviet Russia at the time was through political recognition. Um, but then again, we saw we recognized uh, the Soviet Union later in 1933, but our recognizing the Soviet Union in 1933 had no influence on the horrors that were to come uh, under Stalin in the 1930s. So uh, to me, the, their critique that somehow by politically recognizing them, exchanging ambassadors will somehow influence them, I thought was mistaken. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, they have books for sale and I'll be over there. Thank you.